Alexei Balabanov and the Jew in Chains by Tobin Orba. The first time I met Alexei Balabanov was in 1997. We discussed the script for A Freaks and Men, which I'd translated in its entirety the night before. In the morning, he read my translation, accepted it, and invited me to meet him at the Len Film Studios at his producer, Selyanov's office. The two of us were seated on a couch by a coffee table. Selyanov was smoking at his desk at the darker end of the room, quietly working. People would come in and ask him questions, and they would sort them out in a hush. The man sitting on the couch next to me was in a dark knitted sweater over a white shirt, He'd already gone very bald by this stage, and he'd grown his hair out at the back, creating one of the worst haircuts I'd ever seen. The only analogue for Alexei Balabanov's mullet that I can find was some sort of psychopathic, dangerous professor from an old Hollywood movie. There's a nutcase in a white coat standing next to his latest scientific weapon of doom, screaming, Fools! I will kill them all! At that first meeting, Lyosha actually spoke with the accent of a loony bin scientist, a truly nutty professor who'd come flying off what were some very dangerous rails to begin with. He had studied English by using Soviet textbooks and old novels, listening to the only dusty old recordings that were available in the enclosed language learning laboratories of the Soviet Union. He spoke with absurdly correct pronunciation, a very worrying Eastern European accent, and phrases and expressions from the beginning of the last century, just like some potty scientist in a film. Otherwise, Lyosha was fun and interesting to talk to, and he had a good sense of humour. We almost immediately switched to Russian and started discussing music. Balabanov had been very lucky. By some highly suspicious chance, at the beginning of the 1980s, He'd been sent or allowed to go and study in England, in the north, in Manchester. I am a fan of the Manchester groups of the 70s and onwards, Buzzcocks, Joy Division, The Cult, The Smiths. Later, from Russia, I'd send off to England for bootlegs of the Stone Roses and the Happy Mondays. Lyosha wasn't in the least bit interested in any of that music. He was older than me by just 15 years, and he liked heavy metal bands such as, as he pronounced them, Deep Bubble and Uriah Gip. But elsewhere our tastes did overlap. We both loved The Doors, thought that the only band better than The Beatles was The Rolling Stones, and that the latter's best album was Let It Bleed, Pulse Titshot. We also discussed books. He liked American literature, particularly Faulkner. I love the novel As I Lay Dying, with all those different voices finally speaking for themselves. Balabanov preferred other works by Faulkner, I can't remember which exactly now, but once he asked me to find out how we could buy the rights to two of his stories. We never bought them, but allegedly that's where his film Cargo 200 is from. Cargo 200 is the Russian for soldiers killed in action. At that first meeting, I didn't ask what was a pretty obvious question. Was Alexei Lyosha Balabanov an anti-Semite? A week earlier, at the editorial offices of the magazine where I worked, the Russian editor, Vladik Bachorov, had told me about Balabanov's new film, Brother, where the lead character says, I don't really like Jews. The film had just been released. It was a massive hit and the whole city was talking about it. And we were about to publish our review. The revered and highly overrated Russian director Alexei German was already saying that his former protégé was in fact just a run-of-the-mill fascist. All over town people were talking about it. That was the first time that I, a Jew from North London, even heard that there was a Russian film director in St. Petersburg called Alexei Balabanov. I even went to the screening room at the Len Film Studios to a closed showing for members of staff. My former mother-in-law worked there and she'd got me in free. But as I was walking to meet Balabanov, I thought that it would be awkward to ask, Oh, by the way, are you a racist? He would have dodged the question anyway. In interviews, he said that the character was just a normal, real person, and that's how people talk, which is true. I told Balabanov who I was at that very first meeting. 
We discussed where I come from in detail, and that means we discussed my own Jewish question. I am the son of a Jew who fled Ostrava in Czechoslovakia at the beginning of the Second World War, and an English woman, a war orphan, who grew up in a village in the county of Devon and then in a boarding school for orphans in Shropshire. And that means that I'm only Jew-ish. A lot of me is Jewish, of course, but according to the rules, because of my mother's line, I'm not Jewish at all. A stranger among friends, and a friend among strangers. My mother and father met in London in the middle of the 1960s, fell in love, and when they decided to get married, my father took my mother to meet his parents. By then, my father was a successful young lawyer in the city of London, and he had a Triumph Herald with a soft top. He had a beard, and he smoked a pipe. He parked the car in front of his parents' house, turned off the engine, and told my mother that she shouldn't be shocked, but he had to warn her. On Fridays, his family wears strange hats. It's a tradition. Mum said, all right, and they went in. When my dad told his parents about his and my mum's plans, my grandfather said that it would never have his blessing. My grandparents went to the modest wedding all the same. Mum told me later that it was only after my older brother was born that Grandad came up to her and said, Now you can call me father. Grandad loved me and my brother and my mother too, of course. We'd go to Grandma and Grandad's on Fridays and eat all sorts of kosher food. I really liked slices of challah straight out of the toaster. The butter melted on them and I got very fat and I was a very happy boy. On big Jewish celebrations, my brother and I would put on our best clothes and go with Grandad to synagogue. We didn't study Hebrew, we didn't hang out with the other kids, we didn't go to their clubs and we weren't part of their crowd. We both studied at a private school founded back in the 15th century in the city of London, the actual square mile in the very heart of the capital that was the historic and business centre of Britain. The area is marked out by golden dragons on posts. The school was multi-confessional, but over half of the students were Jewish. That had long been the case. Prosperous Jews sent their children to study there, a notable example being Daniel Radcliffe, the young actor who played Harry Potter. On Tuesdays and Fridays we had school assembly where we would go to a cold, dark, gothic hall of the Victorian era with tall stone arches, narrow stained glass windows and an organ for hymns. We would listen to different speakers who had been invited in, for the most part Christian, but not always. They would tell us the truths of life, of the importance of God, and that we mustn't, under any circumstances, take lots of drugs. Our school valued freedom of choice, however, so you didn't have to go and listen to the bores in the chapel. You could go to an alternative assembly for the Jews among us in the dining room. Following the advice of my brother, who was a couple of years older than me, I headed for the dining room. Dan said it was more fun there. Early on, walking through the school's internal courtyard on the way to assembly, a classmate, Benny Apfel, the son of a rabbi, asked, Are you really Jewish? I said, Yes, sort of. My dad's Jewish. What about your mother? If she's not Jewish, that means you aren't. You can ask any rabbi. My brother and I went to the Jewish assemblies all the same. They let everyone in and it was noisier and more fun than in the chapel. I remember one rabbi, a sprightly old man in small glasses and a felt hat, told us that every member of his tribe had to be able to play a musical instrument so that they could greet the Messiah on his arrival. The little tubby man took his violin out of its case, climbed onto one of the dining room tables and started belting out some number, dancing under the low dining room ceiling, and we all rolled around laughing, shouting, stamping our feet and clapping. I also remember that sometimes we were given paper and pencils and asked to carefully write letters to be sent over the Iron Curtain to Jews in Russia, offering them our support and help in getting out. My brother and I didn't particularly worry about the fact that we were only sort of Jews. We didn't really believe, but we respected the culture and in many ways thought of it as our own. We'd grown up in that culture, after all, with our Jewish grandmother and grandfather who we loved. But all the same, we understood that there was a piece missing from the jigsaw puzzle. I don't remember if I told Balabana of all of this in every detail at our first meeting, but I definitely made my position clear. I'm only a Jew in quotes, 
The handcuffs of punctuation you chain difficult words up with, as Nabokov put it. I also told Lyosha another detail, just to test his reaction. I grew up in the north of London in Kentish Town, a relatively poor neighbourhood at the time, where everyone supported Arsenal, especially the Irish, of whom there were a lot. Later my parents prospered and we moved several miles further north, to Highgate, where Karl Marx is buried, and where a lot more people support the local Jewish team, Tottenham Hotspurs. At matches, the Tottenham fans would wave wads of fresh banknotes in front of the cash-strapped Irish, teasing them. The Arsenal supporters, in turn, would make a tss sound, mimicking the sound of gas being released into a chamber. People always react to the story in different ways. A Russian minigarch positively beamed with joy when I told him about all the fun we used to have back in North London. I can't say I noticed anything special about Balabanov's reaction. He simply appreciated the dark humour of the story, and that was it. In all the years I knew him, we never spoke about the Jewish question again. But several years later, I got my answer to that question, and it came with the same dark humour. This is the story of the Jew in Chains. We'd already shot the second brother film in America, and it was a massive hit, biggest film of the year, and it brought a huge amount of money into CTB. And at the studio, people were saying, maybe it was just a joke of course, that it was Putin's favourite film. There were even rumours that he had the poster from our film as the screensaver on his computer. This only meant one thing to Balabanov. Finally he had the money to make a film that was closer to his heart and to his tastes. The film he really wanted to make, River. I can honestly say that I've never translated a more depressing film in my life. A colony of lepers, Yakut inhabitants of the far north of Siberian Russia, are driven out into the freezing tundra. Slowly and revoltingly, their leprosy rots them away as they die off from the hunger and the cold. Occasionally, they'll carelessly leave putrid fingers lying around, stuck to the iron ladle by the fire, or the handle of the axe they were carrying as they wandered across the endless tiger, desperately searching for something, anything to burn. And that's before a bunch of ravenously hungry brown bears appear right outside their yurt. I can't remember every horrifying detail, but this was the kind of big screen entertainment knocking around inside Lyosha Balabanov's head. When they started making the film in Karelia, a real tragedy took place. The lead actress, Tuyara Svinabayeva, was killed in a car crash and the other passengers, the director of photography Astakhov, Balabanov himself, his wife Nadia Vasilyeva and Balabanov's assistant Marina Lepartia were all seriously injured, taking years to recover. You could say that it was a miracle that they survived. The film was immediately shut down, all the money went up in smoke and Balabanov, in a very short period of time, had to write a new mainstream script, an action movie that would make money fast. So Lyosha went back to a favourite topic he'd already used in his biggest commercial hits, nationalism. He wrote the script for war very quickly. The Chechens kidnapped two English actors who were on tour in Georgia, and a humble Russian conscript saves them from imprisonment. I translated the script and we started looking for an English actor in London. We were looking for a ginger. Very soon, an Englishman, a real actor's actor, Ian Kelly, was being fitted for his costumes at the Len Film Studios. He was living in the St. Petersburg Hotel with a view of the Aurora battleship, and I was showing him the beautiful city of palaces on the Neva River and dragging him round all the bars. And just a few days after that, Ian and I were already living together with a local family in the village of Chegem, high in the mountains of the Caucasus. When we first drove up to the house, and it had been a long drive up a winding, rocky road from Nalchik, bouncing around inside a Kaziol military jeep, Tamara, the mistress of the house, greeted us at the threshold holding a big, sharp knife. Her husband was out. He was looking after the flock higher up the valley, so Tamara was asking us to kill a sheep and undress it before we took our boots off, so that we wouldn't bring any filth into the house. We both turned very pale, and I explained that we're city folk, 
We don't have a lot of experience in this kind of thing. We know how to use a knife and fork, of course, but only at a far later stage in the process. We'd arrived with our guards from Sobr, Russia's elite special forces unit made up of Russians and Caucasians. Their main base was in Nalchik. One of them, Kuri, a vast brick outhouse of a Chechen, saved us. At first, Curie tried to get out of it too. He said that he was in a hurry, that he hadn't done it in ages and that he wasn't in the right clothes for wet work. But Tamara kept on at him. Eventually, he pulled out his knife, asked Tamara to pour him a hundred grams of cognac, knocked it back in one and set off to sort out our dinner. As a practicing alcoholic, I'd been concerned that there would be no alcohol in Chigem because they're all Muslims up that way. So I'd come pre-prepared with what I thought would be sufficient supplies. It turned out, however, that this wasn't a problem at all. Like many of the other houses in the village, Tamara sold stuff through a window in the thick stone wall surrounding her yard. So her cellar was packed with chocolate bars, packets of peanuts and boxes of cold beer. When it got dark, the master of the house came home and told us about the local village entertainments, inviting us to a bar and explaining that, praise be to Allah, the Quran only forbids the drinking of wine, everything else is allowed. Together with Ian and a couple of our guards from Soba, we helped the master of the house load some boxes into the boot of his larder and we headed off to the bar, a small field at the higher end of the village, surrounded by a low stone wall. There, standing under the stars, we smoked, drank and hung out. Almost immediately, one of the local men said that if we see a girl in the village we like, then it's not a problem, they know a priest in Nalchik. I asked, are you fucking serious? And everyone burst out laughing. The vast brick outhouse of a Chechen, Curie, put his arms around me, gave me a massive bear hug and said we didn't even need a priest. We all laughed again, but I was feeling really unnerved. I was shocked. The next morning, when our landlady was making us breakfast, I told her about the offer from the previous evening and asked, just in case, that was a joke, right, Tamara? Tamara, a nursing mother of three, with another four kids on the way as it turned out, told me a very similar story from her own experience. Finding a priest in the Caucasus really isn't a problem. I had a very bad hangover. I could barely look at the Hichin pancakes lying in front of me on the table as I translated all this to Ian, who was also freaking out. I have to point out that by this time, Ian was seriously annoying me and things were about to get a lot worse. The first problem was that basically he didn't drink alcohol and never suffered from hangovers. So from early every morning, with a fresh head as we ate our hichini, he could go on at length about my main problem, that he was an actor. And I don't really like actors. I've worked with a lot of different actors on a lot of different sets, and all of them, if you're foolish enough to give them the chance, will go on endlessly about their creative trials and tribulations in the service of the director's vision and about what it really means to be an actor, with all the suffering and sacrifices that entails and a whole lot more besides. I would always listen to them, give them a few needed words of support and think to myself, I know, it's terrible, but don't worry about it too much. Soon it will be lunch, and then the end of the working day, so please, just be patient, because you're really starting to wind me up. This, however, was far, far worse, because first Ian would sound off at breakfast, then all day on set, and then all night at home, so I often found myself going to tomorrow's cellar in search of cold beer. And anyway, I was already in a very nervous condition as it was. From the moment of our arrival in the Caucasus, I had the strong impression that death had surrounded us and that it was moving ever closer. First, when we flew into Minvord Airport, a rusting iron shed, we waited in the car park for a long time for our lift. When our minibus finally arrived, the driver got out, apologised and explained that on the road to Nalchik, another minibus coming the other way had been blown up in an attack. So there'd been a traffic jam, and can I help you with those suitcases? I immediately thought, should I tell Ian this? 
and kicked myself all the way to Nalchik for deciding not to. I spent the next three hours as we drove in a terrified state, listening to reports about the bombing on the radio. They said two men had been killed. The first night, we stayed in an old Soviet health sanatorium on the outskirts of Nalchik. We ate in the dining hall, served by big fat dinner ladies with massive metal soup ladles, who gave us what they called vitamin salad. When we'd eaten, Lyosha Balabanov invited us to his room for a film screening. Our Sobor guards had brought new operational footage from Chechnya, horrific scenes of torture and executions, and Lyosha thought that Ian should definitely watch it in preparation for his role. This was all before the internet and YouTube. They didn't show things like this on television back then. We all gathered in Lyosha's room and squeezed onto the couch in front of the television. On the screen, a soldier in torn camouflage was told to get on his knees in the thick, wet grass, and he obeyed in silence. He got down on his knees, and out of shot, someone laughed. I couldn't take any more. I went out onto the narrow balcony to have a cigarette, and I didn't go back into the room. Later, Ian told me that they'd cut the man's head off and shot another man in the kneecaps before slitting his throat. I'm a very cowardly person. This really shocked me and I had a really bad time that night. I was convinced that they were going to kidnap me and at one point I was actually hiding under the bed, trying to breathe very quietly, terrified that I'd be heard. After a few days, the entire film crew formed up outside the sanatorium in a massive convoy. U.S. military jeeps, Buhanki army transporters, Kamaz trucks and an array of smaller vehicles. We started climbing up into the mountains. All of us were going to live in a village high up in the Chigem ravine. A couple of years ago, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I went back to Chigem with Katya and our children. I could barely recognise the road into the ravine or the road all the way to the village. Now it's packed with cars, tourist buses, off-roaders and quad bikes for hire. There are dozens of cafes battened on top of one another up the sheer rock cliffs of the narrow gorge. Traffic jams the whole way, especially around the waterfalls, the main tourist site in the region. But when Ian Kelly and I drove up there for the first time, in the autumn of 2001, it was a very different place. When we drove into the mouth of the ravine and the road started to climb high over the river, there wasn't a soul around, just the river itself and the mountains. Here and there along the road we saw multicoloured spots, artificial wreaths by memorials with photographs of the drivers who'd crashed off the road into the chasm below. We climbed higher, hugging up against the sheer cliffs, and then, finally, the convoy stopped by the waterfalls. You can't move for tourists there now, but the place was absolutely dead back then. Just three old women underneath a rock overhang right by the waterfalls. They started a fire and were boiling tea, selling shawls and dolls knitted with the local wool. Our crew of about 50 got down from our vehicles to stretch our legs and have a smoke. Over the sound of the water clattering down onto the rocks, one of the administrators told me that we'd have to wait here indefinitely. Earlier in the morning, a crane had been sent on ahead of us as it was far slower and it had slipped off the road somewhere further up. They were trying to get the passengers out of the cabin. We waited for about an hour and then moved on. Ian and I couldn't see anything out of the window of the Uazic. The drop to the river was too steep. We didn't hear any more about the crane, other than that they said the passengers and driver had got out. That's how we reached Tamara in the Chegem Gorge to do our time, 30 days, in the mountains of the Caucasus. We did actually manage to escape for one whole day, but that turned out to be the exception that proved the rule. Ian was very unhappy as an actor, and as an actor, he told me an awful lot about it. A multitude of scenes in various genres were acted out to me and Tamara in the kitchen, but eventually he said he couldn't carry on working with this director, so he needed to talk to his agent. That meant that we had to get to the town. There was no link with the outside world in Chigem, apart from a massive clunky box the satellite phone, which was hard to set up, almost never worked, and was only used on special occasions because it was so expensive. But then we had a chance. One morning, 
a sober guard told us that the day's shoot had been cancelled, and I quickly made a deal with one of the Uazic drivers. Fifteen minutes later, we were bundling down the rock track back to Nalchik, although we had to take our sobor guards with us. They wanted to go home too. The driver took us to the first and only internet cafe in Nalchik, a scrubby little room with cheap old office furniture and computers from the dark ages. Ian immediately started hammering away at his keyboard like a maniac, writing a note of protest to his agent. I wrote to my brother who lived in London at the time. He said the family are fine. I started checking my other emails and read the newspaper. After about half an hour, my brother suddenly writes back to me. You still here? A plane just flew into some tower in New York. I told Ian, but he didn't really pay any attention, thinking this was probably some kind of family joke nonsense with my brother. I also thought it sounded a bit weird. A bit later, Dan writes to me again. A second plane's flown into the other tower. It's the Twin Towers. Something's going on. Ian also got an email from one of his friends. We started to have our doubts and to look for news online, but we couldn't find anything, so we got our coats and went out into the street. In the next building, in a shop window, there was a whole wall of televisions, one on top of the other, all working. We went up and all of the televisions were showing the streets of New York, in clouds of dust. There were people running around, firemen and maybe shots of a plane flying into a tower. Although maybe I only saw that later, I couldn't say for certain. We stood there in silence in front of the shop window for half an hour. Then our Owazic jeep pulled up. Our guards got out and told us it was time to go back to Chigem. So, that was our day out. But let's take a typical day. They came and got us before dawn. We were taken from Tamaras in jeeps and driven higher up into the gorge. They put a big camping rucksack filled with rocks on Ian's back. Balabanov didn't believe actors, so props had to be properly heavy, just like in real life. Ian was then tied to a long rope and with almost no explanation, lowered into a raging, freezing cold mountain river, a glacier melt as it hurtled almost vertically over the jagged rocks. According to the script, the Russian superhero, conscript Ivan Yermakov, is helping the snivelling English actor John to cross the rapids, pulling him out onto the shore with the rope. The plucky Yermakov is shouting at John and telling him what to do, infuriated but desperately trying to save him all the same, and the English loser, actor of actors, is of no use and barely managing to survive. The problem was that Ian genuinely couldn't handle the river, nor the task being asked of him by his director. The river kept sweeping him away. To be fair, the river didn't carry him very far, because he was wearing a massive rucksack packed with rocks, so he kept stubbornly sinking. Ian couldn't drown entirely, because he was hanging on to the rope with both hands for dear life and, periodically, between takes, we would fish him out. Balabanov was shouting directions from the shore, but it was all drowned out by the roar of the river. The director of photography, Astakhov, was also shouting, explaining that it was very simple. Ian simply had to lean forward, head facing upstream, rather than lying back. Then the force of the current as it hits your chest will raise you and the rucksack up. You can't go feet first up a mountain river. Of course it will wash you away. Any idiot can see that. But Ian was too far away and the river was too loud and he was underwater a lot of the time anyway. When all of us on the shore realised that poor Ian couldn't hear Balabanov and he couldn't hear Astakhov either, we all started shouting at him at once, the whole film crew, using various gestures of the arms and hands to show him what he could do and where he could go. Even for a man dedicated to his profession and his director's vision, a true actor like Ian Kelly, this was too much. That evening, the three of us were in Tamara's kitchen. The mistress of the house had washed her hair and was drinking tea, warming herself by the fire. Wrapped in a blanket, still shivering from the cold, Ian was standing in a tin bowl containing the remains of the warm water. His ginger wet hair was sticking out in all directions and he was furious. 
I was sitting with my beer a little further back, away from the fire, listening to the tirade of a true actor. I look up at you from the river, and I can see you standing there, smoking a fucking cigarette. And next to you is that mental defect, that bald freak with his arms shaking around all like this. And this invalid wants me to simply get up and walk against the current, and he's shouting that it's all very simple. Tobin, you try doing that when you've got the full might of the Chegem River blowing up your ass. In all fairness, Ian was speaking the honest truth. Lyosha was a highly accident-prone, fragile, puny man, and he was standing on the shore with a shattered arm. Back in Nalchik, the lads from the crew had gone out to play volleyball and Balabana had decided to show them how it was done. Within three minutes, they were carrying him off on a stretcher and he spent the rest of the shoot with a broken arm in a sling bouncing around under his chin. And now this lifelong walking wounded was shouting orders at Ian from the shore. Some of the crew said that Belabanov had just had an unlucky fall, but we saw the match with our own eyes, and Ian maintained that it was actually the physical act of touching the ball, for the very first time, that broke his arm or all of his fingers, I can't quite remember. This was entirely typical for Belabanov. He often walked around in bandages, was forever breaking his glasses, he was always complaining about aches and pains in his stomach, he was always ill, and he couldn't open a door without jamming his fingers in it or giving himself a light to severe concussion. Ian pulled his legs out of the tin basin and started getting dressed, saying he was going out right now, at night, through the torrential rain, thunder and lightning outside, up the mountain road, to talk to the director. This was all absolutely unacceptable, and the work was no good. And then he said he'd go without me, and I breathed a massive sigh of relief. I was worried, of course, that in a storm and the darkness, he'd get lost on the mountainside or blunder off into the abyss. But then I thought, you know, Ian is a big boy. It's his decision. If he wants to, he can carry the flag. I'll stay here with my beer in the kitchen at Tamara's. Ian pulled on the striped blue and white jumper of a Russian marine, a thick wool sweater, a massive tarpaulin of a military coat, his soldier's boots from wardrobe, and set off up the mountain, slamming the door after himself. Over our thirty days in the mountains, Ian and I had a large number of stressful moments like that. I'm sure that I annoyed him just as badly as he annoyed me, but all the same we remained friends. When, three days after Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, I fled Russia exactly the same way I'd come to her, 29 years earlier, with a single suitcase and a few thousand dollars in my pocket in cash, but now with Katya and our six children. Ian was the first person to call me and ask if he could help. And he really did help, and that's a whole other story. Ian also wanted to be a writer, and when we were in the mountains, he was already working on something fascinating. He had a contract to write a book about the French chef and proven spy, Antoine Carême. Carême was the first celebrity chef working for Talleyrand, Rothschild and Tsar Alexander I. Back in Petersburg, I'd helped him with research. Later in the mountains, we spent hours on end discussing his book, Historic Food of the Past, and perhaps most importantly, a very key issue. Which restaurant would we go to and what would we have off the menu on the day we finally got out? We were sick of Khichini, Shashlik, Ayran and Salat Shmalat. As Ian pointed out, every time they slaughtered, they kept the carcass of the animal in the cellar along with all the vegetables and other stores, so the stench of mutton was in all the food, from the potatoes down to the sugar. But what Ian and I really talked about were the peculiarities of Russian film in the interpretation of Alexei Lyosha Balabanov. And in those peculiarities, for me personally, lies the nastiest joke of war. When Lyosha gave me the script to translate, he immediately told me to grow my beard out because I was going to be playing a Chechen terrorist. We'd all joked about this previously with the producer, Silyanov, and the rest of the crew. They all said that I looked exactly like a Caucasian, in America, when we shot the second brother film, the crew had nicknamed me Tofik Jan, and they were always asking where they could find the Dagestani bourgeois. It was all a joke, and I was happy to play along, 
To me, it proved the laughable idiocy of nationalism and the idiocy of all the conventions in film. Here I am, an Englishman, even something of a Jew, playing a Muslim terrorist. What's more, I'm an actor, which is entirely ridiculous. I hate actors, after all. I grew out my beard, chose some sunglasses and a beret from the costume department, and spent the whole shoot wandering around in military fatigues, waiting for my chance. On the first day of the shoot, we had the scene of a Russian soldier having his head cut off. The set was right next to Tamara's house, on what passed for a village square in the centre of Chigem. We're standing there while the PAs put the extras in their places. They're all locals who are about to play witnesses to the execution. And I'm in my military outfit, beret and sunglasses on. Suddenly, I hear the director shouting, Where's the bourgeois? Tobin, you're going to shoot it all with a video camera. You're in the truck that drives into the village. You jump down from the cab, someone gives you a camera, and then you film how they chop his head off. You mean, I'm like, the director? Got it, no problems there. I thought it was a good joke. Every filmmaker wants to be a director, right? Balabanov went off to position the extras, and Ian and I were left with our guard, Curie, from Sobor. We asked him, is this possible in Chechnya? An execution in front of women and children? Impossible, said Curie. Our traditions do not allow it. Although, once, some people got burnt in front of everyone, but it was just the one time. We shoot the scene. Several days pass. I'm in a few shots here and there. You can just about see me if you blow the image up on a vast magnifier and look at it through a telescope. And then I get another big roll. Lyosha gives me the video camera and says, You go down into the cellar where they're all being kept, and you film how they cut the finger off one of the hostages, the Jewish businessman. I appreciated the dark humour. An Englishman, almost a Jew, plays an Islamic terrorist, or a freedom fighter. All these conventions in film and not in film, they're all so silly, aren't they? But I was starting to feel very queasy. We shoot the scene. Soon after, we got into a huge conflict with the Sobor guards. An actor, Yevklid Kurzidis, arrived to play one of the Chechens. It was quite a big role. He arrived on set with a very young man who looked about 16 and was planning on living with him in a single room at Tamara's. The two Sobor guards, who were also living with us and Tamara, became enraged and refused to let Yevklid in the building. They spent a long time sitting at the table in Tamara's kitchen, pointedly polishing the barrels of their Kalashnikovs, pulling angry faces and doing their best to express their disgust. Ian and I decided that it looked like the beginning of a very strange porno film for gays. They wouldn't calm down, even after it turned out that the boy was actually Yevklid's nephew, and that he'd simply come along with his uncle to hang out on set and see the mountains. For a whole night, Ian argued with them, explaining that homosexuality is normal, that it's actually none of their business, and they have to be tolerant. The sober men just kept repeating non-stop that it's totally unnatural. Ian argued with them for hours, and I had to translate it all over my beer. I tried to hint to him that there was no point, and that he'd smash his ginger head against the solid wall of the Russian forest and the rocks of the Caucasus. But Ian was having none of it, and he kept repeating that you should always stick up for the truth. He threw everything he had into it, and it went on and on. After Katra and I fled Russia to Turkey, Ian flew down to see us, and we spoke a lot, and we cried a lot. His life hasn't been simple either, and we talked a lot about that evening in the mountains. I told him that I was ashamed of my behaviour, for not having stuck up for him at the time. We never actually resolved the conflict with the Sobor men, and on war, there were many more conflicts of the kind. And then came what might have been our last day in the mountains, right at the end of the shoot. It wasn't a big scene, and it was quite simple. The hostages are led out of the cellar in chains and pushed down a rocky path to a truck. A Chechen is with them, carrying a sheep to be slaughtered. The prisoners are being sent further on into the mountains to be held in a zindan, the hole in the ground Chechens put prisoners in. But one of them is separated off and driven in another direction. The Jew has his own fate. When the Jew is driven away, 
Ian's character starts freaking out, talking about human rights, to which Yermakov tells him to shut up, idiot, or you'll get us all killed. They're pushed into the back of the truck and driven on. So we're all on set. The director is sat in front of playback. That's the monitor on which he sees what the camera sees, what ends up on the screen. He's got his earphones on. Through them he can hear the sound from the microphones that have been pinned on the actors. Everybody's about ready. Lyosha shouts out, Rehearsal! Everyone goes to their starting positions and action! Total chaos breaks out. People are wandering around in various directions. One bloke stopped right in front of the camera. Everyone is acting terribly. Some of the action gets missed out entirely. Balabanov shouts out, Stop! and starts giving out orders to everyone individually. Who, from where, to where, on what cue, what vector you move along, what you do, and where the camera's going to be. No looking into the camera! I'm standing there pretty in my combat gear. AK-47 over my shoulder, berry and black sunglasses in place, the hangover's quite light. And then suddenly, Lyosha comes running over to me and says, Tobin, you're going to drive the Jew off. I nearly jumped out of my skin. You're going that way. You meet him here, you give him a shove with your gun, push him out of the crowd and in the other direction, and then you give him a massive great big kick up the arse. Whiak! I look round at the Jew. He was also listening to all of this with great interest. You punt him right up the backside. And off Lyosha goes to give further instructions. There are lots of actors. We go back to our starting positions. There's another bad rehearsal. Again, everything is wrong. And Lyosha shouts out to everyone. Tobin, why are you being so delicate all of a sudden? Lyosha doesn't like to rehearse and he hates to waste takes. Firstly, we're shooting on film, and after every bad take, he'll start shouting, Why are we burning money? Are you going to pay? But even more importantly, Lyosha saves on rehearsals and hates retakes, because he believes that the energy gets used up. It gets wasted on mechanical repetitions, and there will be no electric current on the film. It'll be lame, and there will be no contact through the screen. He always gets nervous and frets when he shoots. He's irritable, sits at the monitor in his headphones, pulling at his fingers and his nails, bites them, rocking back and forth on his stool, hissing, poking his finger into the screen and expressing his discontent in shouts and barks. I'm standing a long way away, down the rocky path, and I can't hear what he's saying, but I can see him sitting at the monitor, and I can easily imagine. On the previous film in America, I'd been standing by the monitor with him for the whole shoot, he could speak absolutely freely to me in Russian. The Americans around us couldn't understand a word he was saying. And I met the Jew for the first time there too, on Brighton Beach, on the same film. Daniela Bagrov flies into New York and buys a car, a pile of junk, from a stoop-shouldered Jew, a little bit older to be fair, who swears on his mother's life that the car won't let him down. I discussed it with Selyanov when I read the script but I ended up finding them a suitable Jew all the same. I put adverts up all over Brighton with a description of the character. I wrote that acting experience wasn't needed and dropped out the word Jew. At the casting session, 40 old Jews, all of them looking exactly like my grandfather, himself the son of a Jew driven out of Odessa in the pogroms. And right now, Lyosha doesn't believe that I'm kicking him with enough conviction. The actor playing the Jew turned out to be a professional, from the theatre no less. And by that stage, at the end of my time with Ian in the mountains, I really didn't like actors. They'd gotten me to the end of my tether. The Jewish actor tried to calm Balabanov down and promised that there was absolutely no problem at all. He would give me a master class in acting. He would add a little bit of professionalism. Lyosha walked off shouting, but the actor told me not to worry. He said that it's all very simple. You don't have to give a big swing of the leg and a kick. That would be painful, perhaps even dangerous. As an actor, you place the sole of your foot on your partner's posterior and then push away sharply with all your strength. That way you won't hurt anyone, but it will look good on the screen, even quite effective. I thanked the actor for his lesson and promised I would certainly try my best. 
I can see Lyosha is already in his headphones, sitting at the monitor, shouting, waving his arms and barking everyone back to their starting positions. He's knotting and pulling at his fingers, biting his nails and rocking back and forth on his stool. First take! We're shooting this one! The camera operator gives the signal. Mator! First take's most important, second only for insurance. They're already taking the prisoners out of the cellar, and I'm walking, and now's my moment, and I kick him such a kick in the ass that I can feel the pain of the unfortunate Jew all the way through the sole of my Martin's boot to this day. Lyosha screams, Stop! I quickly run over to the actor and apologise. I really didn't want to hurt him, but for the next ten minutes he's hopping around on one leg in agony, just looking at me with his angry, hurt eyes. I promised him that I'd be more careful. I apologised over and over a hundred times and promised that from then on I'd try to do it the way he taught me. I suddenly felt very ashamed. I don't remember how many more takes we did, but I think it was a lot. I also can't tell you exactly what I was thinking as I was doing them all. I don't remember. But if I think about it now, I remember my grandfather and I remember the day I introduced him to my first love, Anna. My interest in her was of a totally different order, but she was Jewish and I knew that my grandfather would like that. He and I had even joked about it. We agreed to meet not far from my job in the city, near the Old Bailey, in my favourite cafe from when I was a schoolboy, at the Cypriots by Blackfriars Bridge. In the mornings, the office clerks and secretaries would buy their sandwiches there, and while the Cypriots were putting them together, they'd shout out questions. You all right, my love? Same as yesterday? By ten o'clock, when everyone had gone off to their offices, it was very quiet. The tables were all free until lunch, and the owner would sit at the table closest to the counter, drinking tea and reading the newspaper. Grandad was waiting for us in front of the cafe, standing alone in an empty street in his wide-brimmed felt hat. Not many people wore hats in London in those days, and a beige raincoat. In his hands, he had a massive bouquet of red roses for Anna. Anna turned bright red. She was very shy, and she didn't say a single word the whole time we ate. But as we were putting our coats on, when we were saying goodbye, my granddad whispered into my ear, Toby, I think she's the one. I also remember my first conversation with Alexei Balabanov after I'd read his script for war. He asked me how we should translate the title into English. If you translate it with a definite article, you get the war, the one and only war, with a beginning and an end. Balabanov didn't want that. If you translate it with the indefinite article, a war, then you get one of many, just another in a series of wars. He didn't want that either. But you can translate it without an article, simply war, without a beginning or end a continual state of hell you exist in and can't escape from. That, that, that's it! That's exactly what I want! Lyosha shouted when I made the suggestion. War can also be an assertion, a declaration, but I don't know if we talked about that. My story in war was just one of many. I didn't have a big role. It was just a little joke among friends, and I'm no big deal in the grand scheme of things. But what I can say is that these were the cockroaches inside the head of Alexei Balabanov, and Lyosha's mind was infested with them. They would crawl out of his bald head, down his crippled arm, and fly on. You have been listening to War, Alexei Balabanov and the Jew in Chains. Written and read by Tobin Orba. Edited by Katya Orba. Music by Karibasi. Sound, Genia Pestrikov. Design, Zoya Ivanova. I stood here all this time for a close-up I'm not going to have. Well, you've got to do something. Because this is fucking nonsense. This is nonsense. I've never... This is the most unprofessional day on a fucking movie I have ever had in my career. I have never waited eight hours to shoot the first fucking shot. 
and I've never been used as a stand-in. It's a, I mean, it's a fucking disgrace. A fucking disgrace. And you all ought to be fucking well ashamed of yourselves. Okay, let's shoot this fucking shot and I'm going home. Be quiet, please. <clears throat> now, you better all start talking to each other. Or I'll fucking go home. Because this is just fucking amateurs. This is amateur night. I've never seen anything like it. In seven, this is my 77th fuck. <laughs>